Swafford. Next is the homicide of Gwendolyn Kazine. The next is Margaret Miller. The next is Catherine Barry. The next is Naomi Kelly. The next is Deborah Blevins. The next is Ann Barnes. The next is Kelly Ford. The next is Angela Mayhew. The next is Sheila Ingold. Go on, Zach. Here's Morgan. Good to see you. Come over here, How are you doing today? This took me on by surprise. Oh, it did? Yeah. What did you think was going to happen? I don't know. We're just having... It's, it's basically just an interview. Um, and here's what I would say to you is, this is your chance just to have your say. Okay. Okay? No one's heard from you for a long time. Okay. You good? Yeah, I'm good. How long have you been in there? Anywhere. In here? In prison? Yeah. Uh, 11 years? 4,289 days. Wow, you remember them all. I might, I might, that might be my first question for you. This man is one of America's most notorious serial killers, known as the Kansas City Strangler. Lorenzo Gilliard was charged with murdering 13 women. He's serving six life sentences. He says he's an innocent man. He has never spoken publicly before. What will Gilliard say to the families of the victims who've been denied answers for decades? She would never hurt anybody for somebody to do what they did to her. If you had the chance to sit opposite him, what would you say to him? We're not stupid. We know what you did. You're the only person walking the face of this earth that did that. If he had a soul, he would at least look me in the eye and tell me he was sorry. I worked lots of homicide cases, but I mean, as far as the amount of victims that he had, the length of time that this went on, no, I, I can't think of anybody more despicable than Gilliard. What Lorenzo did was just stone, evil stuff. Lorenzo, what the hell were you thinking? What, what drove you to do this? Where'd this come from? How'd you do that? How'd you live those two lives? A few hours before this police interview, Lorenzo Gilliard was having supper in a diner. He hadn't killed anyone in over 10 years and thought he got away with murder. Catherine Barry was one of his victims. And that's the photograph of Catherine Barry, discovered 314 of 86 at 3001 Central. Those are your initials on the yes. bottom? Yes. Do you know Catherine Barry? Not to my knowledge, no. Have you ever seen her? Not that I know. To my knowledge, I would have remembered, no. Have you ever had physical contact with her? Not to my knowledge. In March 1986, the naked body of Catherine Barry, a 34-year-old mother of three, had been found half-hidden under a sheet of wood. There was a black stocking knotted tight around her neck. This is where Catherine Barry's body was found. What was unusual to you about this scene? The unusual part of it is that she's partially covered. I mean, she's partially covered with plywood and leaves. The thing is, is that she's not out in the open like some of the others were. And some of the other bodies were deliberately left in a a purposeful pose. Yeah, most of them were left where they would be found, and most of it, I mean, to me or to probably anybody else that would walk up and find that, it would be shocking. Twelve of the 13 that he's believed to have killed were prostitutes who may well have had sex with him voluntarily before he killed them. 
But certainly in Catherine Barry's case, she was not a prostitute. So what, what do you think he did to Catherine Barry? You could assume that it, she didn't have sex willingly with him. She was raped and then murdered? Yes, that'd be my assumption. What kind of monster would do that? How do you pronounce your surname? Gilliard. Gilliard. Yeah. Gilliard, yeah. Lorenzo Gilliard was earning a good salary, working as a supervisor at a waste management company. He was married and living a quiet life. No one suspected he was capable of killing anyone. Let me just ask you, first of all, what has life been like for you inside prison? Uh, it's, it's different, you know. I'm used to being able to travel, have, you know, have, do whatever I wanted to. And here, I, somebody else controls it, you know. In the, the 15 years or so leading up to your arrest, your life seemed to be pretty perfect. You were very happily married to Jackie. You were in a job that you loved and you were successful. You'd become a supervisor. You had very nice cars that you took great pride in. You went on very nice holidays. Life seemed pretty good, Lorenzo, in that period for you. Yes, it was. Yes, it was, I wish you hadn't brought up her. Jackie. Yeah. How do you feel about her now? I nothing. I just missed. I, nothing. I, I don't. I'm not angry with her. She hasn't done anything. She was nothing but a great wife. Because you had a good marriage, right? Yeah. I, I, to me, it was. I, I assume to her, it was also. Here you were, a man who had found true love with a woman that he really adored. You had this very rare Mercedes worth yeah. over $100,000. You bought your wife a Mercedes. Yeah, but see, we had five of them. I kept, we traded up. Not only did I have a nice car I had, I had two or three Platinum MasterCards, two or three Visas, Platinum Visas. I had a Platinum Discover. I had a gold Neiman Marcus. You had I, a Rolex watch, right? I had, yeah, I traded in my, I had a Piaget watch at first. She bought me a Piaget at first, and I traded it in and got a Rolex. Because one of the inexplicable things about all this is why somebody who was having such a wonderful life, apparently, would want to commit offenses like this. I, I can't imagine. I didn't, you know. Do you, do you think you're a violent person? I get angry just like everybody else, it's, you know, uh, about stuff that I, that I find not true about. What, what really makes you angry? Lying. So, Carl, we're now turning into Troost Avenue, and this, at the time of these killings, was where many local prostitutes would work, is that right? Right, that's true. They would walk back and forth down Troost Avenue. Gilliard was, without a doubt, very cunning. He was very cunning. You know, he's the kind of guy that you would not expect, like a lot of serial killers. He was very uh, meticulous in uh, what he did. Uh, he was careful. He didn't, he, you know, he didn't have a lot of friends. He didn't associate with a lot of people. So, you know, nobody really knew much about him to suspect him of anything. Lorenzo Gilliard was living a double life. At work, he was popular and respected. Lorenzo was, he was a good guy. He was always eager to help or happy to help, and he never complained. He just, just did his job and did it with a smile. Lorenzo was the kind of guy you wanted out in the neighborhoods. You wanted interacting with customers. I liked working with him. You just took him as you found him. 
good stand-up guy. Gilliard had made it out of a tough neighborhood and was living here in a comfortable suburb of Kansas City. This was the house that we lived in at the time, and that was the house that Lorenzo Gilliard and his wife lived in. He's someone I, I knew from day one. I, I would never trust. One of the first days that we had moved in, we were bringing a TV home. And to get the TV in, I was going to back the, the truck into the driveway. And he said, I, I want you to come inside and, and look at something. I want to show you something. He came around from the corner from a bedroom, evidently, and had 38 pistols in each hand. And he told me, "This, you see these? This, this is mine. And this is my wife's. And if anybody comes in my yard, I'll shoot them. That's not normal behavior. That's not normal. Normal behavior, it wasn't. Three years later, he was arrested, and they found out who their neighbor really was. Gilliard was given six life sentences without the possibility of parole. The 53-year-old sanitation worker will die in prison. How do you feel, Lorenzo, about the fact that you are sitting here as a convicted man, as one of America's worst serial killers? How does that make you feel? I, I hate it. I truly hate it. And I wish you wouldn't use that term again while we t uh, uh, in a conversation. The phrase serial killer? Yeah, and, I mean... and, and America's worst. Right. Because then I'll get up, I will leave. Right. Because I don't, I hate that. Why do you take exception to that? Because that's, that's just, that's wrong. Uh, no, that's, that's, what does it mean to you, that kind of phrase? Why, why do you take such exception to it? That's horrible. That's the best work I, I can term. I can. You think serial killers are horrible people and you don't want to be associated no, with them? No, uh-uh. And that term, yes, I, I don't want to be... You've been given a, a tag which you hate and you don't want me to repeat it because you hate it so much, but it's a tag that you know is now associated with your name. If you put your name into the internet, up comes Lorenzo Gilliard and Serial Killer. You know that. Right. It's not me. I'm not coming up with it myself. Right. Um, and yet you find that tag really offensive because you believe you're an innocent man. No, I don't believe it. I know I am. Okay? When Catherine Barry, the mother of three, got into Lorenzo Gilliard's car, she was mentally unwell and vulnerable. Leaving her family at home, she would walk the streets of Kansas City, trying to educate people about God. Her daughter Dawn was 16 at the time of the murder. Dawn, you discover that this was a serial killer who killed your mother. Did that make it worse for you, to know that she was just part of this monster's indiscriminate spree? Yeah, it made it really hard to swallow to think he'd gotten away with it and had done, done it that many times. Um, yeah, it made me angry, it made me really angry. She would have been a very easy target for him. How you could do that to such a kind and sweet soul, I'll never understand. A person with a heart couldn't do what he did. Gilliard has denied even meeting Dawn's mother, let alone strangling her to death. How will he react when I confront him with the faces of the women who were killed? She too was found shoeless like all the victims and placed in a sexually suggestive pose. Her body contained the semen of the defendant and no one else. The crime started back in 1977 and spanned three decades. Women strangled between 1977 and 1993. Lorenzo Gilliard is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of murder in the first degree for the deaths of Catherine Berry. For the murders of Catherine Berry, Naomi, Naomi Kelly, Kelly, and Barnes. And Barnes. Kelly Ford. 
Kelly Ford, Sheila Ingold, and Carmeline Hibbs. First photograph I'm showing you is Sheila Ingold. Do you know Miss Ingold? Not to my knowledge, no, I don't. And this is a photograph of Stacy Swafford. I didn't know her. Have you ever had physical contact? Not with to Ms. my knowledge, no. Kelly Ford, have you ever seen Miss Ford? Not to my knowledge. Photograph of Connie Luther. Is... Not to my knowledge, no, nope, I don't know her neither. You don't know her. No. Have you ever had physical contact with Not her? Not to my knowledge. Carmeline Hibbs, do you know Miss Hibbs? Not to my knowledge. Let me take you to the moment <clears throat> when you were arrested. You remember that? Oh, I remember it like it was yesterday. Tell me, tell me what happened in your own words. These two black guys came in and asked, you know, what's my name? Was I said, yeah. So said, well, uh, we'd like to talk to you downtown. I said, who are you? And he told me they were detectives. Did they tell you what they wanted to talk no, to you about? No, he just said he wanted to talk to me. Did you have any idea? What I, didn't know, I didn't know what they were talking about, but, you know. So I, you were shocked? Yeah, I was shocked. So when I get downtown, they got to show me, they asked me about some, show me some, they, they said, uh, do you know these people here some one picture at a time? I said, no, I don't know. I, not to my knowledge. I don't know. They showed you photographs of 13 women. No, it wasn't no 13. It was uh, like five or six. Right. Yeah. They and they asked if you'd ever met them. Yeah. And I said, no, not to my knowledge. You know, and these well, are... I think they asked you, I think I'm right in saying they asked you two questions about each woman. They said, have you ever met this person and have you ever had sex with them? Yeah. And you said no, no, no to all of them. No, I said no, to, not to my knowledge. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Not to your knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And none of these women look familiar to you? No, because these were little bitty black and white pictures, so, you know, I couldn't... I, I, and did they then tell you why they wanted to talk to you? No, uh-uh. So when we got to talking then, I said, man, what are we talking about? I just want to um, look at some pictures here. These are some of the people they showed you the pictures, the same thing. These are just a few of the, the images, uh, Lorenzo. Yeah, see, they wouldn't like that, though. See, this, this yeah. picture here, Sheila Ingold. Now... That's you, the only person that they actually... You did know her? No, I didn't know her, but... but she was a friend of the woman you were yeah, seeing at the right, time? Yeah, right, right. You'd never met her? Never met her. Never seen her. Do you recognize her now? No. Uh-uh. Never seen her before in my life. This, this was Catherine Barry. This was Catherine Barry. Um... <laughs> Have you ever seen her? I've never seen her. Doesn't ring any bells at all? No, she never rings a bell. Never rung a bell. This was Gwendolyn Kazine. She was just 15. It's obviously not a good image yeah. of her, but she was very, she was the youngest yeah. of these victims, 15-year-old girl. I've never seen her, never knew her. What do you feel, Lorenzo, about what happened to all these women? Because they were all taken off the streets. They were all strangled. And each strangulation apparently took several minutes. I mean, it's a gruesome way to die. Right, I know. What, what do you feel about what happened to them? I feel bad, but then uh, nothing I could do about it. One of the things that just stood out to me was that when we went to his apartment to do a search, was how extremely neat he was. I'd never really seen a man be quite that neat. Incredibly tidy, clinical, precise. Everything was yes. everything was organized. It was yes. all very clean. Yes. Uh, if you went to look in a drawer, he could not only tell you what was in the drawer, in what order it was in. And I found that very unusual for a man. Does that tell you that he was a man who liked to be completely in control? Yes, that's exactly what that indicates. And when you look at the precision with which he carried out these murders and the way he left these poor women, again, it was all very orderly, it was very carefully executed. Yes. Her body was found at 45th and Garfield. Almost three years later, 15-year-old Gwendolyn Kazine was found dead at 1312 Paseo, a wire still wrapped around her.
her neck. Next was Margaret Miller. Found in the 1970s and 80s, Lorenzo Gilliard was living within a two-mile radius of where many of the bodies were found. The last woman he was accused of killing was Connie Luther. Her body was found here with a shoestring tied around her neck. You were working these streets for seven or eight years when we now know Lorenzo Gilliard was picking women off the very streets you were on. I feel extremely fortunate that I survived, but for girls and women who, this is how they made their livelihood, this is how they survived, what were we to do? We had to take our chances. You didn't know who this killer was, what he looked like, how old he was, anything. I know for myself, you know, I would get in a car after I tried to look for obvious things and then I would just start praying. I mean, I was in a constant prayer, you know? And I know that's, some people don't understand that, but, you know, um, when you're hungry or when you have bills to pay and this is all that you know and this is all that you've known since you were a child, you know, you, you do what you do and it, it was scary. You know that these girls are getting taken by what they think is a client and they're being taken to horrific deaths. Yes. Yeah, so that's what's going through your mind, you know, the whole time that you're in the car. When you're looking for your friend and where is she and no one's seen her and then now a body's shown up and you're waiting for the name and you find out that someone you knew was murdered. I mean, it was a terrifying time for everybody. Your sister um, ended up sadly as a prostitute, didn't she? What, what impact did that have on you? I don't know how to answer that. It didn't have no impact one way or another. How did you feel about her being a, a prostitute? Did you feel sad about that? Yeah, uh, because I, you know, I tried to give, I wanted her to have one more for her than that. You lived and worked in an area where there were lots of women working the streets at night, lots of prostitutes. What is your view of prostitution? I, don't, I had them. I didn't, frankly, I didn't have one view one way or another. You know, if that, that was if that's how they you know, worked to make their money, I guess. You know, you didn't find it a, a repellent profession. I don't know, man. I don't, I can't. I don't know how to answer that. When you say repellent, what do you mean? I found it disgusting. Yeah. I hated it. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm not. I don't know what to say about that. Have you ever had sex with a prostitute? I don't know. You don't know? No. You wouldn't forget, would you? If he was at, back then, man, clubs was club. When we went clubbing, no matter, you know, women just, they, they might have been working the streets at night, but they'd come to clubs. So, you know, I don't know. But have you ever paid a woman for sex? No. No, I haven't. Never? Never. Would you ever? If she looked good enough, probably I would. I don't know. I, I, I ain't gonna put my, I wouldn't ever put myself in that position. No, I, I, I don't know, man. You, it, you, basically, I, I was always taught, you, you pay, pay a woman for sex all the time. If you buy her a drink, a, a dinner, take her out and buy, do anything, that's paying for it. Do you think all women are prostitutes, basically? No, I didn't say that. That's what you're implying. And I'm going to get in our conversation now. Because well, you, you're taking things well, out of well, context. No, 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 because you're taking things out of context. Lorenzo, I didn't apply that. I don't think I am taking things out of context. I'm trying to work out what you're telling me. You just said, when I said to you, you know, what do you feel about paying women for sex? You said, well, you pay women for sex all the time when you buy them dinner. And then like, you don't call them prostitutes. You call them Right, but, I, but, but my question was about prostitutes. So obviously when you answer the way you did, I don't think it's irrational of me to then think you, you look at all women in that no, way. No, I don't. I, so if you want to clarify that, please clarify it. No, I don't look at them. I'm not trying that. to be unnecessarily hostile. No. I'm just reacting to what you're telling me. So explain what you meant. Most men, when you go, you know, when you take a lady out, what do you want? Have sex, right? Mm. So you buy her dinner. Buy her or take her to a movie. It's app in hopes of what? Having sex with her later on. Well, I don't think it always has to lead to sex, does it? I mean, man, 
Either they, if, if they don't, you're gay. If it doesn't lead to sex, you're gay. Yeah. That's what, man, you, you, you're trying to, that's what's, be, that's what's cause you're trying to pretend like that, that's, that's not, it, never in your repertoire. You know, you ain't never seen a beautiful woman or a pretty woman and said, so, well, you know, buy her lunch and hope, a few drinks and hopefully go to the hotel or go someplace. No, but I wouldn't assume that, that if I didn't have sex with a woman after a date in my life, that somehow that meant I was gay. That it was an automatic thing. It would no, always, no, I didn't say it was automatic. It would always thing. be entirely of, of yeah, the no. choice of the woman. Right, and, right. And by the way, there are many, many dates that happen every minute of the day that there's no right, okay, consequence of sex. The either first way. time, the first time out. But eventually, that's what's going to lead up to. Right. You're right. You're very angry. Understandably, if, as you say, you're an innocent man, you're very angry. What do you man, hope? I'm sorry if I. Put, you know, it's just, I'm getting tired, you know, of, I, I didn't kill these people. Now, I'm 68 years old. I right. don't have, when you put in, try to put words in my mouth, or twist it to, you know. I, I, I honestly don't want to put any words in your mouth. If I would have had sex with them, I would have paid them. Gilliard says he's never had sex with any of the women he's convicted of killing. So how will he explain that the semen found on their bodies was his? Lorenzo Gilliard is telling me he's never even met the women he's convicted of killing. Any suggestion that he has gets an angry response. When you were interviewed by the police originally, you said you'd never met any of these women. And I had, I, and not you, to my knowledge. And to, I your, didn't. and to your knowledge, you'd never had sex with them. Right. To, just to clarify, you never told your lawyer you had sex with any of these women. No, I never did. He just made that up. I guess he did. I never told him that. Just if you're going to keep saying that, then I'm going to get up and leave. No, no, because no. Because I keep telling you, I didn't tell him no, that. No, Lorenzo. That's beginning to piss me off. I didn't tell I him that. I don't have to lie. Lorenzo, I, I have no dog in this fight. No. I'm just trying to work out well, what you happened. Keep, I'm saying over and, I keep telling you over and over. I didn't tell him that. Right. Gilliard will spend the rest of his life in prison, but he nearly got away with murder. For years, police were finding the bodies of women, but they had no suspects and no idea there was a serial killer on the loose. Then, one November morning in 1987, they found the semi-naked body of Sheila Ingold in an abandoned van. This murder would eventually lead to the capture of Lorenzo Gilliard, almost 30 years after he's believed to have first killed. This is where Sheila Engel was found, right there. Right there. The vans were parked out here in this lot. The Kansas City Strangler killed four women in 1987, the busiest year. Among them, Shelia Ingold's body was discovered in an abandoned van on Troost. Lorenzo Gilliard had a personal connection to Sheila Ingold. He was dating her friend. She was the tenth woman he's accused of killing, but it was the first time the police would link him directly to a murder. Sheila Ingold was found here in a van. Gilliard was right there and that tan building over there, and it used to be a fish market. And he was there getting fish the day the body was found. So that was the first time that you were able to place him in the immediate proximity to one of the dead women? Yes. Gilliard admits to being at the fish market while the police were on the crime scene for Sheila Ingo. One of the main things that led us to uh, believe that Gilliard was involved was Charles Berry told me that there was an individual 
that wanted to look at the van. Who's Charles Berry? Charles Berry was the individual that had the, the car shop here that owned the vans. So the man who had the store here said that a man named Lorenzo came and inquired about that van. Yes. And he didn't want to see any of the rest of the vans. He wanted to see that particular one, even though he was told that that particular van was just one they used for parts. So you now have him opposite where her body was found, and you have him inquiring about trying to get that van. Yes. And you put all that together, and what have you got? A killer. Gilliard was questioned. Blood and hair samples were taken. But there was not enough evidence to charge him. What was curious about uh, her death was that you were just opposite where her body was found. And also, you'd made inquiries made about it. buying the truck. No, no, I didn't know nothing about no truck. You never made any inquiries about it? No, uh-uh. I just want to go through the things that happened to you in your earlier life, and I want you to tell me, just honestly, what your reaction to it is. Yeah. Um, between 1969 and 1974, you were a suspect in five separate rape cases, but you were never convicted. Yeah. What do you remember about those cases? One of them was a girlfriend. Uh, and that's about, that's, in 1969, that's how it started. Mm. So then after that, whenever in the neighborhoods where I lived in the hood, whenever rapes came up, I guess they come to rest, you know, see who lived in the neighborhood. In 1975, you were charged with raping a friend's sister near the Missouri River. You were charged with beating and raping her. You told police she was lying. Ultimately, you pled guilty to molesting the girl, and you got a nine-month sentence in Jackson County Jail. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember that. What, what happened there? I don't know. She's passed away, and her sister is passed away. That's who I was living with, was her sister. And I don't want to discuss that, what happened with that. In 1980, you, you assaulted and threatened to shoot your wife, who then divorced you. And the next month, you assaulted your ex-wife twice. You beat and pistol-whipped her. <laughs> is, this, is this true? No, she lied. But was it an abusive relationship? Did you hit her? No. You never hit her? Oh, well, she, if she hit me, yes. I guess I ain't going to lie. I did. You yeah. did, did hit her? Yeah. The reason that they arrested you and then charged you, and indeed why you got convicted, was that they found your DNA on all of these victims' bodies. So they say. Right. But th th as you know, that's why you got convicted. Right, right. And the odds on this being anybody but you, according to a forensic expert in court, is one in 18 quadrillion. That's one in 18 million billion chance that it could be somebody else other than you. I mean, these are extraordinary statistics. In this particular case, it was, it was shocking that all 13 of those cases existed, but up until 2004, there had been no resolution to them. So many victims, so many cases. It's 13 people. That was the biggest we'd ever seen in, in Kansas City's history. 12 of the bodies had semen on them, but detectives had no way of knowing they were all from the same man. The murders went unsolved. But then in 2003, over 10 years since Gilliard had last killed, a grant from the federal government enabled DNA analysis of those semen samples. We had Lorenzo Gilliard's a blood standard from him that was actually on file in our freezer. Um, and it had actually been taken in conjunction with the Sheila Ingold case. We pulled the standard and decided to run it to see if we could make an association or cross him off as a potential suspect. There was a moment, oh my God, it was the same profile. It was a very exciting resolution, so that there was finally an answer to all 12 of these cases that were now connected to one person. Gilliard has always said the Kansas City police framed him. He insists the DNA samples were tampered with, 
degraded too much for accurate testing or lost. I'm trying to work out the truth here because obviously you're facing at the moment the rest of your life right. in this yeah. prison yeah. for crimes that you say you didn't commit. I did not. Why would the police frame you, do you think? I don't know. Your guess is good as mine's. They, I, at that time, my, my assumption was they were trying, everybody was trying to make a name. Right, but what makes no sense to me, Lorenzo, is that they arrested you years and years later. They were just told by the DNA laboratory guys, this is the DNA we found on the bodies. And the one match they found on every one of those bodies' DNA was your DNA. Nobody else's. No one else they'd interviewed. And I don't understand okay. why so much later down the line they would have any vested interest How in did they have you? my DNA to, to, to match it to anything? Well, they had it from when you were tested. Tested when? Back in the... Uh, 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 well, you know I, when you were tested, right? I've never been tested. For I've DNA. Never, they've never had no... But they had your blood and they had your... No, it was thumb. destroyed in 1998. But during the process of them interviewing you and arresting you over Sheila Ingold's death, yeah. they did take samples off you. They yeah. took blood samples, they took and, and, hair, and, and they took saliva, right? No, they didn't take no saliva. They just took that back. What, just, did they, what did you give them? Blood and, blood and hair. Right. That was enough for them later when DNA testing came in to get your DNA from that, but see, from that, those samples. But your argument is those samples were destroyed. Those samples was destroyed. But when they arrested you again, years and years later, in connection with all these offences, they did more tests on you, didn't they? No. They didn't get no DNA from me then. They didn't? No. They didn't take any blood tests? No. No, no. more samples? No. They did not. The police arrested you for 13 murders. 12, okay. Well, 12, 12, but okay. it was 13 in court. Fine. And they never, never took any samples off No, you. never did. So you told me that his, Mr. Gilliard, alleges his sample was never taken again in 2004. Um, and we, we have a sample in 2004 that was taken from him that we, we used for DNA analysis. So I know that's, um, that can't be true, essentially. And not only did we have his DNA on our victims, but we also had victims' DNA on items taken from Mr. Gilliard. In 2004, they took a brand new DNA standard from Mr. Gilliard and once we completed analysis on that, we went back and checked to make sure that, that standard matched all 13 cases. It matched the 1987 blood standard that we had from Mr. Gilliard. Um, so everything across the board was consistent. It was all the same person. You have very good memory, incredibly precise memory about everything. You can remember specific dates going back decades. Yes. And yet you occasionally have erupted with anger and threatened because to leave. And, and it's, it suddenly fires up out of nowhere. I've shared a lot with y'all, and I've got nothing in return for... You know, what, do you, what do you want in return from me? Nothing. Just I'm not, I'm nothing. I just get... I, I felt offended, I guess. What were you offended by? Uh, the terms that you used and some of the questions. What would you say to all the families of these women? I'm sorry what happened to them. That's all I can say. I didn't do it, but I'm sorry. Margaret Miller has discovered 5-9 of 82, 37th of Garfield. Do you know, or did you know, Miss Miller? Not to, know. Not to my knowledge, no. Nope. Have you ever had physical contact with Miss Miller? Not to my knowledge. Have you ever seen Miss Miller? No, nope. not to my knowledge. Carmeline Hibbs, do you know Miss Hibbs? Not to my knowledge, no. Have you ever seen Miss Hibbs? Not to my knowledge, no. Have you ever had any physical contact with her? Not to my knowledge, no. Nope. No. Nope. Not to my knowledge, not to my knowledge, not to my knowledge, I can't, nope, I didn't know her, nope, not to my knowledge. Have you ever seen her? Not that I know, not to my knowledge.
Does it matter to you whether I believe you or not? No, not really. I don't know why I would. What, what do you I, hope? After, after you walk out of this room, I, you know. You see, I, I think you're a plausible talker. You have an answer for everything. But I found some of what you've said about women a little bit disturbing. I think other people will too. You've admitted to potentially being a violent man. We know you have a record of convictions for sexual assault and I for th violence. I thought you said... I thought you well, said. well you, have, you have criminal convictions for assault and for violence, mm -hmm. right? You, do ha you, don't, you haven't contested that. Mm -hmm. When you put it all together and you have the police saying they're categorically, in their words to me, there is not a one in a hundred million chance it was anybody but Lorenzo Gilliard. Mm -hmm. The DNA from him directly matched each, every one of these women. It's very hard to look at you, Lorenzo, and see an innocent man. Okay. Then, I, then that's it. So, are we through then? If you don't, yeah, that's good. Has any part of you, and I'll be straight with you, you've always denied all this, despite the overwhelming evidence. Overwhelming evidence? DNA. That's DNA is pretty overwhelming. Okay. According to the police, okay. According to anyone that studies the DNA results. And who else did it uh, but the, uh, the Kansas City Police Department? Well, let me ask you this then. If it wasn't you, who else was it? I don't know. I don't know. You've, have you got any theories? No. I don't know. I, I, I don't know, man. I truly don't know. The, the problem I have, Lorenzo, is that you go from being this charming, well-spoken, polite man to somebody very different very quickly. And so, so You go to somebody that I could imagine, if he was angry and he was pushed enough, could be very dangerous. Okay, so what, 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 what these women have made me angry or pushed enough to do to make me hurt them? You tell me. I'm asking you. I, they couldn't have done nothing. They couldn't have done nothing. Did they disrespect you? I don't know how they. I don't know how they could have disrespected me. I didn't know them. Yet your DNA was found all over their bodies. Okay. But you know that. All right. All over their bodies. Come on. I know that wasn't right. It was in the in their air, air sex area with uh, Sheila Engel. It was a spot on her leg. How did they get her? I don't know. You never met her, you said. I never met her. I don't know. Uh, I, I just truly don't know. And what was your defense in court? I truly don't know. I was just there. You have no idea what your defense was? No. I read, I you read were it. You were charged with killing 13 women by strangulation, and you have no idea what your defense was. Do you think I'm an idiot, Lorenzo? Do I look an idiot to you? Can I go back? <laughs> Have a good day, y'all. Thank you. All right. Here, this is y'all. Tonight, Lorenzo Gilliard will go back to his cell, as he does every night and reflect, perhaps, on how he could have grown old with his wife, Jackie, the woman he told me he loved. Instead, he will die in prison, a serial killer whose past eventually caught up with him. You don't have your mom, 
there's a part of you that just, that, that missing piece that you have growing up, you never get over it. You just get the feeling he's managed to avoid having to deal with any of this in yeah. terms of accountability. Yeah, nobody's, I mean, since the trial, I'm sure nobody's been in his face to tell him. He's done no you're interviews, full of it. no, nothing. Yeah. He's not had anybody do it to. Good. And it unnerved him. As a human being, we all have that innate compassion. He doesn't have it. Mm. Having spent time with him, I actually think being incarcerated for the rest of your life for someone like him might be the best of all punishments. That actually brings me a little bit of peace to know that he's suffering. He should suffer because he devastated us and we can't get it back. So good. I'm glad to hear that he's quite miserable. I hope it continues.